Welcome to Cordell and Cordell's Men's Divorce Podcast, moderated by managing partner and CEO Scott Trout, bringing you information for guys before, during, and after divorce, and everything related to family law. This podcast is not to be taken as legal advice, and no attorney-client relationship is established. Hey, welcome back to the Men's Divorce Podcast. Scott Trout, CEO, Managing Partner, Cordell and Cordell, and bringing you more information for guys before, during, and after divorce in our podcast. And we're joined by our litigation partner, Will Hallis. Welcome. Good morning. Hey, let's talk about trial. It's kind of the, you know, the one thing that a lot of guys, a lot of people just don't know, you know, what is it, what's going to go on? It's the mystery. It's, you know, what happens at all court events. You know, hopefully you've only gone through it one time. And so this isn't familiar with you. It's not like riding a bike. Uh, And so there is a lot of questions about, you know, how does it work? You know, we see if you're watching the Johnny Depp trial, you kind of get some flavor for what's going on. And, or if you watch any of these, you know, trials on television and you kind of keep pace, you kind of understand what's happening, but many don't. And it's the mystery and you're nervous and everything's on the line. And so you have a lot of questions. So that's why I thought we'd break it down today in a very general sense and walk through what to expect when you walk through those courtroom doors, what's it going to look like, what's going to be like, what's going to happen. You know, there's always the question, do we have a jury trial? Uh, we'll talk about that. There are two states in the country that allow jury trials in family law, believe it or not, and one of them actually allows juries to talk about uh, custody. It's shocking, but it is what it is. So start at the beginning. Um, a lot of lawyers don't take advantage of what I think is very critical. I'm curious your opinion, and that is opening statements. Let's talk a little bit about opening statements. Yeah, opening statements are great. Um, not every jurisdiction or every judge really allows them or, or, or encourages them, but they can be a really great opportunity for you to give the judge an overview of what they're going to hear. In, during the case, you kind of give them that that early framework so that they can follow what you're presenting them throughout the case. Um, yeah. There are important parts to uh, the opening statement. It can't be argumentative. Um, you're not allowed to make arguments in the opening statement, but you you tell the court what you expect the court will hear. And you'll hear a lot of that in a lot of attorneys opening statements. You know, judge, we expect that you will hear the evidence will show, you know, those sort of, of statements. And then just lay out your map, you know, let the judge know, here's what we're going to be telling you. Here's what we're going to be asking you at the end of this case. Yeah, and it is about telling a story. And, you know, these judges, I think you're right. You you want them to understand where you're going with it. They see this, hear it every day. And maybe their mindset is, oh, here we go again. The same old facts I've heard 100,000 times. And, you know, you want to break, you know, that you know, bias that they may have in certain directions or where are we going with this? This is, you know, bored. So again, if you, like you said, if you use opening statements to kind of build that roadmap and, hey, judge, here's what's coming. And here's, you know, the theory of our case, you know, wife committed misconduct, wife was guilty of adultery, and we're going to prove that. And we're going to show you why we should, we're asking for more property and she's a bad mom or whatever it may be. And this is why just set it right off the bat. Um, I think that's a really good use. Uh, and a lot of lawyers, I think, I don't know what your experience is, shy away from opening statements because it's not a civil case, you know, that you traditionally have those or we don't do those. Um, you may not do them, but if the court allows you to, you know, I don't know, why wouldn't you? You know, I assume you, you may get that feedback about lawyers not wanting to do them. Yeah, the, it's so it's interesting because a lot of a lot of lawyers are nervous about doing something that they don't see other attorneys doing, um, which to me is not necessarily a reason to not do it. Uh, it may even be more of a reason to do it. If you're the only one who's doing it, you're the one who knows how to do it. And especially for the more complex cases. And if you have an argument that maybe is something that a judge doesn't typically hear, it's all the more important to put that out there at the very beginning so that the judge can grab onto that, can recognize that, hey, I'm going to have to actually pay attention uh, to the the details of this case rather than, like you said, that sort of ho-hum, okay, this is what I've heard before, custody, property, whatever. If you put it out there in the opening statement that, hey, judge, you're going to hear something new today, something different than what you've heard before, that, that 
perks the judge's ears up and, and puts them on notice. Hey, I've, I've got to pay attention. And I think uh, and Bob, if I'm sitting on the bench and I get you telling me, hey, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to start taking some notes. Here's what he's going to tell me. Here's the issue. Here's what he's going to show me as proof or, you know, what he's going to do. And I'm going to find out now you've piqued my attention. You've kind of uh, framed the issues for me as a judge. I don't have to parse through all this extraneous information. I'm just going to get to the heart of it. All right. You know, Will, if you're going to tell me there's adultery. I'm writing down adultery. And what are you wanting now? I'm going to write down when I hear evidence, what you've given to me and whether or not it supports your conclusion. I think it's a really good way of, you know, it could be a full day. It could be days. It could be a week trial of really framing the issues. If you're following that Johnny Depp, I keep referring to it because I'm, I'm kind of uh, fixated on that trial for really one purpose. And that is I like to evaluate other lawyers. I like to see what they do and I like to see the presentation. I think you have a lot to learn as lawyers you can give to your clients. But I think evidence and objections, if you've watched anything, Johnny Depp's lawyers are doing a masterful job of disrupting the other side and their cadence their flow by constantly, I think it's Vasquez is her name, I think. She, every, objection, here's a objection, leading, objection. We hear that and so clients naturally, they don't understand what, why are we objecting? What does that mean? What role does objecting about evidence and, and putting evidence you know, coming into play? Let's talk maybe about objections first and then talk about evidence. You know, kind of give me your thoughts on, on objections. So objections can be a little confusing uh, for a client who hasn't been in court before or you know, is not really familiar with the court process because once somebody says objection, it's, it's a real key to the judge. Obviously, the judge needs to be paying attention because they have to rule on the objection. Um, but like you said, it also can sort of disrupt that flow of the case, disrupt the, the testimony that the judge is hearing. So the, the important part about objections, um, two things. First, is like I said, when you hear that objection, particularly for clients, that's your cue to stop talking. Okay. Judges really don't like it when people are talking over objections. Court reporter can't take it down. It makes things difficult. And, and you want the judge to recognize that you recognize the authority of the court and that the court has to make a ruling in this instance. So then more importantly, though, objections are the gatekeepers of evidence. Uh, it, it forms the rules. It is the rules. Uh, that tell the judge what comes in and what stays out. And sometimes there's there's discretion on the judge. If they want to allow something in, they can allow it in. But for the most part, the rules are, are pretty straightforward. And so, you know, the, the, the big ones you hear, hearsay, uh, relevance, foundation. Um, and, you know, like you said, on, that, on the Johnny Depp trial, there's a right way and a wrong way to object and a right time and a wrong time to object. Um, you may have seen, you know, all those the, the videos and the memes of uh, Amber Heard's attorney objecting repeatedly over things that are seemingly inconsequential, right? And you certainly have to make objections for the record uh, when there are things that are important. Um, but sometimes an experienced attorney is, good, is going to know when to object and when to not object because you don't want to draw attention to something that doesn't really matter. Right. Um, but it is important. Like I said, those are the gatekeepers of the evidence. That is what tells the judge what can come in, what can't. And so you may have information that is very relevant to your case and, and very important to your case. But if you don't have the ability to lay the proper foundation or if it's hearsay evidence, you know, if it's something that somebody heard from somebody else from somebody else, the court can't take that into consideration because there's concern about the reliability of that evidence. And so that's a big part of that evidence and, and the rules of evidence is to ensure that the court is getting evidence that is reliable. And so when your attorney, when your attorney objects, that's what they're doing. They're making sure that the court knows, hey, judge, there's a question about the reliability of this evidence and, and it probably shouldn't come in. Then the judge has to make the ruling. And so you have to wait for that ruling. Um, and for attorneys, it's actually very important to, to get that ruling on the record of whether that objection was sustained, which means that the person should not answer the question and that you have to move on to the next question or rephrase the question in a way where, where you can get that evidence in, uh, or if the objection is overruled and then you do have to answer that question, that evidence is about to come in. Yeah. Yeah, objections, as you say, I think it's right. It's time to object and not to, and clients do get confused by that or they get upset. Well, why didn't you object? Yeah, clearly, I now understand what hearsay is. And, 
every, you know, in this era or this moment, you know, your jury is your, is the judge is the jury. And so you got to balance the flow to, and know when to do it. And I think it's right. So, I mean, we could go on and on about ev- our objections. Let's talk about the evidence. You know, there's some confusion. You know, how does it flow? Well, you know, I know there's, do I get on the stand? You know, then what do they get to do? Witness testimony, direct cross. Let's talk yeah. about that. So that's, that might be the most nerve wracking part for most clients is to get up on the stand because you're not in court every day, right? We're in, attorneys, we're in court, <laughs> maybe not every day, but very often. So we're comfortable there, but it can be uncomfortable. To be, you're sitting up on the stand, questions are being asked of you, but that is the majority of the evidence that comes into trial is witness testimony. Uh, that comes through uh, to one of two ways. Uh, when your attorney is asking you questions, that's called direct examination. Okay. And that's, those are those sort of more tradition, what I call the traditional reporter type questions, you know, who, what, when, where, why, how those open-ended questions where you're really telling the judge what the information is. You're telling the story, your attorney is just sort of guiding you through that story to help keep you on task and keep you um, in line with the theory of your case and the theme of your case. The other way is through cross-examination. So that's when the other attorney is going to ask you questions. Those are going to be more of the, uh, what we call leading questions, because you're not allowed to ask leading questions on direct, only on cross. But those are going to be those questions that are basically just yes or no questions. If the attorney is doing their job right, they should be asking mostly, if not exclusively, those yes and no questions. On cross-examination, the idea is to poke holes in the case to say, you know, well, this isn't exactly true, is it? And, you know, again, we can reference back to the the Amber Heard Johnny Depp trial. And you've seen that. You've seen um, some good cross-examination. You've seen some bad cross-examination there. Um, But, you know, focusing in on that cross-examination to the areas that are important and and poking those holes or or blowing gigantic holes, if you can, into the other side's testimony, those, those are the two areas where you get the most evidence, the the testimony from uh, the witnesses. And then we have what we would call physical evidence. Those are going to be things like documents, pictures, videos, audio recordings, um, things that are tangible, things that you can see, hear, touch, uh, the judge can read. And those those are ones where you're going to run into more of those sort of outside objections of you know, hearsay foundation, because there's certain things that the attorney has to do before they can get that type of information into evidence with the court. Yeah. And I think there's always, if if, if your attorney has this pre-trial prep meeting with you and here's the evidence I'm going to present and here's what we're going to get into in the subject matter of direct and cross, then the client doesn't have this. Well, why didn't you introduce this? Why didn't you ask this question? There are some things that you want to avoid and having that meeting, insisting, if you're watching, insist on a a prep meeting well in advance of trial. So you can get those questions out. Okay, why aren't we going to do this? And your attorney can explain it rather than having the frustration at trial of of why is this not being done? I've seen that so many times where clients come to us as the second lawyer in and my attorney didn't put this evidence in and my attorney didn't do these questions and not knowing what the strategy was, but it should be explained to you. And that's your opportunity to ask the questions of your attorney. Okay, well, tell me why. And having that conversation, yeah, which kind of talks as we talked about opening and the process of kind of, I mean, we're shortening this trial into a very condensed, you know, uh, super speed, like, oh, it makes it sound simple. But once all the questions are done and the evidence is presented, we talked about opening, now we transition into closing statements, right? And that's something that Again, I think you don't see a lot of attorneys doing closing, but why is that equally important? Right. So same reason why you don't see a lot of attorneys doing it, because they don't see other attorneys doing it, which, again, not a great reason, you know, just because somebody else isn't doing that particular trial uh, tactic or taking advantage of that part of trial doesn't mean that your attorney shouldn't do it. So with a closing argument, and it's a closing statement, but a closing argument, you are allowed to be argumentative. You, that's kind of the point of it, right? You are presenting to the judge or your attorney is presenting to the judge what you want and why you're correct. So, uh, you know, very important to um, summarize for the judge, particularly in a long trial. You know, if you've got a multiple day trial or if it's just if it's been a long day. Um, it's particularly important to provide the judge that summary to go back and say, you know, judge, remember, you heard this. 
you saw this evidence. You, you always have to go back and reference evidence that actually made it into the record. OK, so that's why it's really important on during the testimony to get that information into the record and to be paying attention to what evidence, what uh, exhibits may not have gotten into the record because of objections. And so using the evidence that did come in at trial, you're going to remind the judge of all of that information that supports your case and say, judge, here's why you have to rule the way that I'm telling you to rule the way that I'm asking you to rule. You know, the evidence requires you to rule in this way. The other thing is, it's really important when you look back at your opening statement, and this is kind of where these two things come together, is to make sure that you're making good on those promises you said in your opening statement. That's why it's really important to know what evidence is going to come in during trial and, and be prepared for that. Because if you don't have that evidence, you may not be able to make that really strong closing argument without that information. You just can't reference information that didn't come in at trial in your closing argument. Yeah. So you tell the judge, this is what needs to be done. This is what how you have to rule based on all of the evidence that you've just heard. Yeah, I mean, I think it is, right? It's, it's pointing out they've heard so much, perhaps the other side wasn't so concise. And there's so much information. You could sum it up by saying, judge, I'm well, you know, our position is they failed to show contribution towards the business. This is a separate asset. They fail to show that they've done anything to increase the value of this business. You tie in, I would, I would tie in law with the facts, and this is why you need to rule for us, judge. And really make the judge that argument of like, wow, that makes sense. Well, I'm going to write that down. Of course, they didn't prove that. I wouldn't have thought of that. And it's just helping the judge uh, kind of put all those pieces of the puzzle together, um, which leaves us with kind of, you know, it seems very simple and straightforward. You know, you've got opening, you've got uh, direct testimony, objections and closing, but there's this generalized, all this stuff in the middle, the grab bag of things that may or may not occur during a case. I've always explained to clients, uh, I did some federal practice before in family law many, many, many years ago where you had to disclose all of your witnesses. You had to, you knew exactly what was coming in the door. You pretty much knew all what the testimony was going to be. In family law, there may be a witness you're not prepped for. There may be somebody that you, you, perhaps you didn't ask the right questions in prep, in, in uh, discovery, and somebody walks through those doors and you're like, who is this? It's kind of that moment where you have to kind of adapt, right? Yeah, and, and that's a big part of trial in general is being able to adapt. And there's a number of things that you have to, to have to adapt to. Like I said, for example, with objections, there are certain objections where the judge has some discretion and they can say, oh, well, one thing you hear a lot in family court is, well, I'll, I'll give it the weight that it's appropriate. Okay. And that's really frustrating for an attorney, right? Where, where something that you know probably shouldn't be coming into evidence, but the judge allows it in anyway, because they're the judge. They feel like, I know what I'm talking about. I can give this the appropriate weight. So in that circumstance, you have to be ready to adapt. You have to think on your feet. And that's kind of the hallmark of a good trial attorney yeah. as somebody who's able to think on their feet. So don't be surprised as a client, you know, if, if you've gone through your trial prep like you should, you've gone through, these are these are the exhibits we're going to put in. This is the testimony we're going to elicit. This is what we're going to do for the other side to, to sort of counteract the evidence that they're going to be presenting in. And something doesn't go the way that you expect it. You have to be ready and willing to adapt to that. Also, um, one of the other hallmarks of, of a good trial attorney is being able to read a judge. OK, because judges are people, too. Right. And they have their uh, sort of idiosyncrasies, things that they like to hear, things they don't like to hear. And like I said, there are important things that you need to make sure that you get on the record and, and you have to make that record in case your case is one of those cases that does have to go up on appeal. You have to ask a higher court to, to look at what happened from the lower court. But you also want to be paying attention to the judge and what they're interested in, what they're not interested in. Um, there may be things that that you individually feel this is this is the very important part of my case. OK, um, I, I use the example of a child getting a tattoo. OK, a 17 year old. They're not an adult yet, but they the other parent went and allowed them to get a tattoo to you. That might be a, a huge breach of you know joint legal custody. And, and your attorney absolutely should make those points and put that out in front of the judge. But if the judge is not interested in that, you don't want to spend half an hour on that. You want to hit it, make sure the judge is aware that this is what the other side did, that they weren't supposed to do. 
and then move on to your next point that is yeah. equally important and, and keep moving the case forward and and presenting to the judge those arguments that you need the judge to hear. Yeah, I think of presidential debates. You know, they get you've got 30 seconds, Mr. President, and you're not going to go on a tangent about something that is not going to influence a voter or someone watching. When you have a limited amount of time, you're going to get your key speaking points out immediately. Uh, appellate work is that way. You get so many minutes to present your case. While that may be a very relevant fact about a tattoo, there's a way to do it in very short order and move on. Uh, judges are derailed by emotion. They have an attention span, just like every human being. And if you don't keep their attention, when you're presenting something that's key and important, uh, they're going to miss it. Uh, I remember I was trying a case in, in Atlanta and the opposing counsel was going on and on and on about stuff. The judge actually picked up a newspaper and started reading the newspaper during the case. He was so bored with this fact that they were going on and on about that to me, it was like, this is so irrelevant. Yeah, maybe my guy was kind of wrong in that way, but it was not going to sway the case. They wanted to make an hour long deal about it. And I was thinking we just won because a judge had lost interest. And I think that's a really good fact. And, and it's very difficult for clients to understand that. I know that's their biggest complaint is why didn't you spend more time on that? Because it's important to them. And, and it's, they're frustrated. The, the relationship, that's what they think it's all about. But you know, that's why you got to find the right lawyer, trust your lawyer's legal counsel, and making sure they know what should be presented in the best manner to put you in the position to be successful. I think that's a really good point. A lot of that goes back to the, the trial prep, having that prep meeting with your attorney, knowing going into it, these, these are things that we've already, because you've already talked to the judges, the, the attorneys have talked to the judge before the trial. You're not going into the trial, never having talked to your judge. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's rare circumstances that would happen, but you go into trial knowing what the judge finds to be important, finds to be relevant. And so you have that discussion with your attorney prior to the trial so that you're not surprised mid trial where, you know, your attorney didn't ask, maybe uh, didn't spend more time on an issue that, that you would have expected, but for that trial prep meeting where you went over and said, okay, here, we're going to spend, we're going to get this information in, but we're not going to spend a ton of time on it. Here's why we're going to keep moving on. Yep. Well, well, that is, uh, I know in whatever, 15 or 20 minutes, we try to break it down and it's much more complicated, but right. we wanted to highlight the points and, and kind of, so, you know, again, these podcasts are not intended to be absolute, you know, walk away. I know everything. It's stimulated conversation. It's not legal advice. It's just, Hey, let's have a conversation as you suggest with your attorney, uh, be informed, be knowledgeable, educate yourself. Knowledge is power. Just as why we have Google. You know, go Google it and figure it out. And it's a good starting point. So thanks for joining, Will. Appreciate it. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Well, continue to tune in and remember to subscribe to the podcast. You'll be alerted when we drop one, uh, as we do, and bring information for you about all aspects of family law. So visit us online at mensdivorce.com, dadsdivorce.com, or you can find more information about Cordell & Cordell by giving us a call at 866-DADS-LAW or going to cordellcordell.com. You can schedule an appointment with us. Consultation is the only way to get legal advice. We can do that via phone, internet, in person, whatever is appropriate for you. So until next time, have a great week.